thank you for joining us today here at Cross Creek. Whether you have found us on a Sunday or throughout the rest of the week, we start today a series that we're going to be in the book of Numbers chapter 9 entitled Lost in the Wilderness. Our theme verse is the very first thir- verse of chapter 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, now you're going to have to hold on to see exactly what the Lord told them on their second year outside of Egypt, what they were supposed to do. But no matter who you are or where you've been, we've all have experienced moments where we have been lost in our lives, lost in the wilderness. It could have been a decision that you made and you screwed up your life and you made a poor choice. Or it could have been a choice done to you by someone else. Either way, you have found yourself in a very difficult situation in life. You have found yourself lost in this wilderness. What do you do? Where do you go? And how do you respond? The next two weeks, we're going to be looking at that. So I'm going to ask you to get your Bibles, open up to Numbers chapter 9. And for the next two weeks, let's take apart this really amazing chapter inside the Word of God. And let's get going. It's called the yips. It's a mental issue for athletes. Athletes who can normally do something very simple have a mental block that keeps them from doing the most simplest thing in their sports. And nowhere is this worse but in baseball, where just throwing a ball a short distance is the most simplest play, but the most urgent thing you have to do as a baseball player. Some of the famous players were Steve Sachs, who originally played for the Dodgers and then went on to play with the Yankees, developed an overwhelming issue. The shortest throw in baseball from second base position over to first, he could not do it. Then there's Chuck Knobloch, who played for the Twins and then the Yankees. I'm sensing a trend, don't play for the Yankees. But also as a second baseman, could not make the simplest throw over the first base. In fact, his most famous play was hitting a lady in the stands during a division playoff game. It got so bad he had to switch positions and move to the outfield because he could not just throw the shortest throw in baseball. There are catchers like Gerald Sotomaka, whose last name is the longest ever in Major League Baseball. Catchers who can't make the easiest throw when time is called just to throw it back to the pitchers. He played one year for the Tigers, but was mostly known for his time with the Red Sox. But he developed this problem and could not throw the ball as a catcher with timeout back to the pitcher. And he had to seek mental help for it. And then there are the positive stories. There's Rick Ankel. Rick Ankel was a good to great pitcher for the Cardinals. And in the 2000 National League Division Championship Series, he just could not throw the ball over the plate to the catcher. And after five wild pitches, they took him out. And eventually, he had to give up being a pitcher. His story has a happy ending because he went back to the minor leagues and worked his way up, not as a pitcher, but as a center fielder. And after a few years in the minor leagues, he came back and actually in his first appearance as a Cardinal as a, as a position player in center field hit a home run in his first at bat. But I think the best is a pitcher by the name of Daniel Bard. Daniel Bard in 2009 began pitching for the Boston Red Sox and he was a great pitcher. But in 2013, he just could not get the ball over the plate. It became so difficult for him. He just completely gave up all on being a player. He gave up and became a mental skills coach for the Arizona Diamondbacks. And the story goes that while he was just warming up with players and throwing, some of the younger players are like, man, you can really throw. You've really got something here. And he just kind of laughed it off, but they kept pressuring him to try. And he got on the mound and found himself throwing 95 miles an hour. And he began working at it and working at it. In 2022, he was back in Major League Baseball pitching for the Colorado Rockies. In fact, finished 16th in the MVP. I say all this to say that when you can't throw a baseball to the simplest throw to first base, you are lost. You are lost in a wilderness 
inside your own mind. And so maybe it's not throwing a baseball that has gotten into your head, but whatever it is that has gotten into you and has put you in this wilderness, you have a choice. And it is as simple as throwing a baseball back to the pitcher or to first base. You can choose the choice of sitting down, of sitting down and giving up, or you could try to find a way out of where you're at in this wilderness. You see, the overwhelming theme in the Bible is that Jesus is searching for us. Jesus is the good shepherd who leaves the 99 and goes searching for the one missing. Jesus is the father whose son has gotten lost into the world. And every day he goes out to the end of the road looking for his boy to come back. And that time he finally sees him goes running to meet him and hugs him and picks him up. If you're taking notes today, our one simple truth as we start this series is when you are lost, Jesus will find you. You see, as a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not our responsibility to get ourselves out of the wilderness. Now, it is our responsibility not to go further into it, but it is Jesus that is the answer. It is Jesus that is going to get us out. You see, when he does this at salvation, the Bible says there is rejoicing in the presence of angels when somebody comes to know Christ as their Savior. And I'd like to point out that we often say it's the angels that are rejoicing, but if you look closer at Scripture, it says that the rejoicing is in the presence of the angels. I would like to suggest to you that it is Jesus who is rejoicing when a sinner comes home. And when a prodigal son comes home, he throws a party. He announces to everyone that my son who was once lost is found. My son who was once gone is now home. If you are lost, if you are finding yourself in a moment of despair in a wilderness, whether it's created by your mind or whether it is something someone else has done for you, the good news today is this. Jesus is looking for you. So in Numbers chapter 9, the children of Israel are starting year two of wandering in the desert. They went up to the promised land, but they rejected God's plan. And because of that now, they will spend 40 years wandering in the Sinai Peninsula. But in this moment, God speaks to Moses. In verse 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year, after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying this, Lest the children of Israel also keep the Passover at this appointed season. The Passover, the very first one, is now one year removed. The events that we're going to describe take place in Exodus chapter 12, a year before. But each one of the events and each one of the elements in the Passover had a special meaning. The lamb represented Jesus. The spotless male lamb would die to save all that were inside the house. The blood of that lamb would be placed on the doorpost and around the door and everyone who was inside it would live much like the blood of Jesus would be shed at Calvary. This is why Jesus will say of himself, I am the door to heaven. No one comes through it, but through me. This is why John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus, will yell, behold, the lamb of God, which comes to take away the sins of the world. The family together inside the house, well, it represents the fellowship of believers. The families gathered inside the house would see the death angel pass over them. Anyone who was outside would die. You see, you need to be part of a local New Testament church. The story goes of a pastor who pastored a congregation out in the country. One of his older, kind of a cranky guys just stopped coming to church. And after about a month, he thought, well, I'm going to go visit him. He was a very stubborn man and really knew he couldn't talk him into coming back to church. So I went to his house out in the woods and talked with him. And the older man invited him in and courtesy. And they sat down next to the fireplace while the fire was going. They didn't say anything for a couple minutes. And the pastor reached over and grabbed the poker and slowly took one of the hot coals and just poured it away from the fire and let it stand on its own. As it was separated from the hot coals, that once hot coal began to slowly cool down into the fact it became completely cool and it was good for nothing. The old man looked up at the pastor and said, I get your message, preacher. I'll see you on Sunday. 
You need a spiritual family. You need a good Bible preaching church to be part of. Third, the fire represents judgment. The lamb was roasted in fire. Fire always represents judgment. On the cross, the judgment and the wrath of God was poured out onto Jesus. And Jesus describes hell as a place with fire. Fourth, the unleavened bread represented the sinless body of Jesus. Leaven in the Bible always represents sin, and Jesus' body had none of it. When Jesus speaks at the first Lord's Supper, he will take that unleavened bread and he will break it and he will say, take, eat, this is my body. Jesus was fully God and fully man, and he did not sin. And lastly, the bitter herbs. I will confess that I studied the herbs this week, trying to find what could the possible meaning of the bitter herbs be. And I liked what Dr. McGee said, and he said it represents the struggles of life. You see, life will not always be a mountaintop experience. The truth is we live most of our life, not on a mountaintop, but in the valley. And Jesus said, the world is going to hate you. Why? Because it hated Jesus first. But see, just because you have difficult times doesn't mean you're a bad Christian. Difficult times do not prove you have no faith. That is a lie that if you only had enough faith, you wouldn't experience hardships. If you only had enough faith, God will have to do whatever you ask and tell him to do. That is a lie. But the truth is difficult times prove how much of Jesus we need. Your life will not be easy if you come to know Christ as your personal savior. If you decide today to get serious with this thing called your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, your salvation, if you'd get up every day and deciding to crucify the flesh and die to yourself every day, life is not going to be easier. In fact, there's a very good chance it's going to get harder on you. But the simple truth is no matter what the world throws at you, if you have Jesus, you can get through it. Difficult times only prove how much more we need Jesus. But in the midst of this time of remembering, a problem arises. Some of the men in the camp have touched a dead body and it has made them unclean. Verse six says, and there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron. And on that day, verse seven, and those men said unto them, we are defiled by the dead body of a man. Wherefore, are we kept back? Meaning, can we not do this? That we may not offer an offering of the Lord in this appointed season among the children of Israel? Will we be excluded from this, they're asking, because we have touched a dead body? We are, thank God, not under the Old Testament law. We are right now in a period of Sabbath. We are a time where we get to rest from the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law could never save you. It was not designed to do that. It was designed to show you that you could not save yourself and that you were a sinner. But that Old Testament law did protect you. Not eating pig, well, especially in the climate they lived in, was really a healthy practice to do, to not eat. And shellfish that they were forbidden to, well, it can poison you if it's not prepared correctly. You see, God knew about this thing called germs long before man did. And God knew touching a dead body could infect you. And he said, don't touch one and you won't be able to do the Passover. You see, God had some crazy ideas about germs. In fact, the Bible actually says that gives them instructions that if they have to use the restroom, go outside the camp and dig a hole and take care of it. Why? Because God knew about germs. You see, these men would be excluded. Well, what about them? Do they not to get take do they not to get take take part of the Passover meal? Verse 8 says that Moses says, "Okay, hold on, let me go ask God." Verse 11 says God says, "Well, okay, they can do it, but they have to wait an extra month." And verse 14 is even more amazing because God then says, "Hey, everybody who's in the camp who's not a Hebrew, they can partake participate in the Passover. They just have to get circumcised." You need to understand that in the Old Testament, they were supposed to be evangelistic, just as we are in the church. Verse 14 says, both for the stranger and for them that was born in the land, meaning the Jew and the Gentile. If you like to put notes in your Bible, put Galatians 3.28 next to verse 14. Galatians 3.28 is a parallel New Testament verse that says this, there is neither Jew nor Greek. 
There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye all are one in Christ Jesus. There's two life-changing truths I'd like you to get out of what we just read. And the first is that the grace of God is great. The grace of God is great. You will never get outside of God's grace. You will never get outside of his love. You will never be outside of his forgiveness. There is always an opportunity to repent, come back, start over, accept Christ. It is always there for you. But that other truth I want you to hear, listen to God. You need to listen to God. You know, in preparing this message, I asked a friend to read Numbers 9 and just give me their opinion about it. And I said, just tell me what you think. And they came back and they asked the, this question. Why did they listen to Moses? Did they just take Moses at his word? And I thought about that for a moment. And then I responded with, well, let me remind you of what they had just gone through in just a year's period of time. And I want to list all of these things. This is what the children of Israel have just experienced in one year. They used to be, and they were slaves to the Egyptians. Moses, who everyone knew as a prince of Egypt, just sort of showed up. The 10 plagues rained down, not on them, but on the Egyptians that were right next to them. The death angel has just passed over them. They heard the screams and the cry of parents in the land of the Egyptians. They are completely freed as slaves. And then the Red Sea parts for them as they walk through on dry land. And the Egyptians behind them are destroyed by that exact same water. Out there in the desert, they watch a rock get hit by a rod and give out water. Every morning for them, food just appears on the ground. And when they get tired of it, God gives them quail to just show up and eat in the desert. In a few chapters, they will see the ground open up and swallow people. And also in a few chapters, that whole snakes biting people thing will take place. The whole Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai story has already happened. And this untrained former slaves have defeated trained armies. <clears throat> so when Moses says, hold on, let me go talk to God. No one bats an eye because for them, this is nothing. This is just a regular Tuesday for them. This whole event is a great advertisement for your Bible. You need to listen to God. The story goes of a grandfather and grandson are walking down the beach. The grandson's telling his grandfather that he just has a hard time reading his Bible and he doesn't understand most of it and he doesn't understand why he should have to read it. As they were walking along, the grandfather saw an old bucket kind of floating along near the edge of a dock. He went over and picked up the bucket and looked at it. It was dirty and it had a hole in it. And he told his grandson, take that over to the edge of the water and I just want you to take that bucket with the hole in it. It's dirty and filthy, but I just want you to stow in there and scoop up some water. Grandson didn't really understand why, but he respected his grandfather and he went over to the edge of the dock and took this old dirty bucket with a major hole in it and started scooping up water and scooping up water. And after he did it about four or five times, the grandfather said, okay, now stop, look at your bucket. The grandson looks at it and the grandfather says, did it hold any water? And the grandson said, no, it didn't hold any water. But the grandfather says, but look how clean the bucket is now. Look, if you don't understand everything that God is saying in the word of God, that's okay. But you know, the simple truth is even a, a young elementary student can understand about 98% of what God is saying. Do that part. Do the obvious parts that God is saying. It, you don't have to have a doctorate degree about to forgive someone, about turning the other cheek. You don't have to be in a Christian for decades to know that you're supposed to share your faith. You see, if you are lost in the wilderness, just follow Jesus and the word of God is your roadmap out. But Moses goes on to give a clear warning in verse 12. They shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it. The breaking of a bone is a clear reference to John 1936, when Jesus was on the cross and none of his bones were broken. According to the ordinance of the Passover, they shall keep it. But the man that is clean and that is not in a journey and forbeareth, meaning he chooses not to keep the Passover, to keep the Passover, even the same soul. I'd like to stop for a moment and remind you that you are a triune being. 
You have a physical body. You have a spirit which is dead until you come to know Christ as your personal savior. It connects you with God. And when you are experiencing the new birth, that spirit comes alive and you are a soul, a soul that will live forever somewhere. Your soul is who you really are. Other translations translate this word as person, but I feel that it is more accurate in the King James Bible here as soul. In fact, this word is translated in the Old Testament 475 times as soul and only 29 times as person. And it shall be cut off, meaning you will be killed. They will experience death from among his people because he brought not the offering of the Lord at, at, in his appointed season, that man shall bear his sin. You see, you can bear the punishment for your own sin, just like those who in this moment will choose not to participate in the Passover. They will bear the punishment for their own sin. You could do that, but why would you when there's an alternative? You see, you can do your own sin and take the punishment, or you can let the lamb be the punishment in your place. This is about as clear of a picture of salvation as you can find because the bones of the lamb are not broken. The lamb dies in your place if you choose to accept it. You see, salvation is simple. You are a sinner. Death is coming for you. And without Jesus, you will experience the second death, which is an eternity separated from Jesus. Jesus calls it a place called hell. But whatever you experience it, Anything that doesn't have Jesus for eternity is not a life I want to experience. Today is the day of salvation. Today is your opportunity to let Jesus pay for your sin, or you could experience that yourself. So when we are stuck in a wilderness, we have three things we need to do. Number one, stop going deeper into the wilderness. Moving in the wrong direction is just going to make your journey back to where you need to be even longer. And whether it's an addiction or an abusive relationship or just simply sin, stop and stop going further into it. The captain of a ship looked into the dark night and saw a light in the distance. Immediately, he told his signalmen to send a message, alter your course 10 degrees south. He promptly received a reply that said, alter your course 10 degrees north. The furious captain sent out another message and said, alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a captain. Soon another reply came back, alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a seaman third degree. The captain this time was completely furious and he sent his next message and said, alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a battleship. The man replied with this, alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a lighthouse. Do not fix a bad idea with a worse idea. Do not go further and further and further into a bad idea. Stop where you are. Find Jesus as your lighthouse. Go to him. Let him direct you. Let Jesus change that bad habit. Let Jesus remove that sin. Let Jesus help old wounds begin to heal. You see, the Israelites have a choice here. They could listen to God and the God who has done miracle after miracle, or they could go wandering off on their own into the desert. And you know what? So do you. You have a choice to make. You can listen to the God who loves you, who sent his only begotten son to die for you, who has given you the miracle of life, or you can go further into the wilderness of sin. Stop going forward into the wilderness. The second thing you need to do when you're in the wilderness, help others out of the wilderness. The story goes of a lady. She was a senior and she had lost her husband that year and she had just fallen into depression. She felt miserable and she just couldn't get out of bed many days to finally she went to talk to her pastor and said, I'd like to make an appointment to meet with you and talk with you about what I'm experiencing going through. And the pastor said, well, to be perfectly honest, I just don't have time to meet with you. I've got a lot on my plate. And he said, do you think you could help me? Well, she was a little offended at it, a little taken back, but she said, okay, I guess I can. And he said, I've got all these senior citizen ladies who are widows also, and they need some attention. They need someone to help them. And I just want you to go and I'm going to give you some cards and I want you to call on them and visit them. 
Well, she was a little upset with this, but she thought, I'll do it because he asked me. So she began to visit with these senior ladies and she began to have a ministry. She started taking them to doctor's appointments, to shopping. She started calling on them, just encouraging them. Until finally a couple months went by and after church one time, the pastor went up to her and says, well, you know, I have some time now. If you would like to meet to discuss the issues that you're going through, the depression and how you're feeling, I have time to do it. And this lady looked back at him and said, I don't have time to talk to you. I have all these ladies who are counting on me, who need me. I don't have time to think about what I'm going through. Look, you do not heal fully until you start to focus on the hurts of others. Here's a crazy idea for you. The pain and all the agony that you have gone through through the wilderness and you have finally gotten out, maybe God gave it to you so that you could help other people. It can't be for nothing. You see, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness here for 40 years. Who else wandered these same desert roads and this same path for 40 years? Well, it was Moses. When you help others with the story of your pain, that is when you really begin to heal. I have a friend and we discuss, that's a nice word to say, argue, about what you're supposed to say about the things that happen in your life. And I always tell them, you have such an amazing story. I'm proud to know you, everything that you've gone through. I think it's amazing. You should tell more people. And they're always, no, I don't, I don't want other people to know what I've gone through. You know, sometimes healing doesn't begin until you start to share what God has done for you. When the focus of your story stops being about your pain and helping others, that is when you know you're healed. And lastly, when you're in the wilderness, remember how you never gave up. Remember how you never gave up. You could buy something to commemorate it, maybe a, a picture or a clock and put it on a mantle, whatever it helps you with. But really the best thing you have are your memories. You're struggling with quitting today? Well then remind yourself how yesterday you didn't quit and you kept moving forward and you kept and you didn't stop. In 1945, during World War II with most of the fighting men gone, the St. Louis Browns baseball team needed players. So they called up a one-armed man to play baseball named Pete Gray. Gray, who batted 218 that year for them in just 77 games, he only struck out 11 times in over 200 at bats. And how well would Gray have been if he had had both arms? He was asked that question and he said, who knows? Maybe I wouldn't have been done as well because I probably wouldn't have been so determined. In September at that year, he was sent back down to the minors. But he said it was his proudest achievement to finally, after years in the minor leagues, with only one arm, make it to the major leagues. He was interviewed in a nursing home late in his life. And he said, the proudest thing is that he, I never gave up. I never gave up. All the years of playing in the minor year leagues, all the years of hearing cat calls from the stands, I never gave up. And yeah, it was just a short period of a three or four month time, but I got to have my dream. I played in Yankee Stadium. I got to play professional baseball. I never gave up. You see, I don't know what your struggle is, but if a one-armed man can keep fighting and get his chance in the major leagues, well, you have Jesus. You got this. See, you didn't quit yesterday, so don't quit today. Keep going, keep moving. Every day they broke down their tents out there in the wilderness. They had to think, why are we doing this? Can we do this today? Can we break this all down again and move forward? And I think someone would probably remind them, hey, we did it yesterday. We did it yesterday, we can do it today. Look, yesterday you were able to do it, and if you could do it yesterday, you can do it today. In the wilderness, don't stop. Help other people, and just remember, you did it before, and you can do it again. Go to Jesus, and don't stop. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you have a great Sunday, or whenever you find us.